The Royal Society for the Encouragement of Arts, Manufactures and Commerce runs a public lecture programme exploring contemporary issues. Teachers TV has access to these lectures and today we bring you the lecture by Professor Howard Gardner on his theme of Future Minds. Howard Gardner is the Hobbes Professor of Cognition and Education at Harvard Graduate School of Education and author of the book Five Minds for the Future. He is well known for his work on multiple intelligences and learning styles, but here he discusses the kinds of capacities and ways of thinking that he believes will be needed in our globalised world. We've sent a group of teachers to listen to his talk and we'll hear their responses after the lecture. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to speak about a forthcoming book called Five Minds for the Future. And for those of you who know something about my work, I have to begin with a disclaimer. Um, I am the person responsible for suggesting that human beings have various kinds of intelligence, what we call the theory of multiple intelligences. And I claim that human beings are better described not as having a single intelligence, but for having a number of relatively discrete intellectual capacities. When I write about the intelligences, and when I speak about them, I'm talking as a psychologist, and I'm speculating about how the mind evolved and how it's organized um, now. When I'm speaking about five minds for the future, I'm not speaking particularly as a psychologist. I'm speaking much more as a policy buff, a policy maker, suggesting the kinds of human capacities and skills which we'll have to cultivate in the future, both so we can survive as a species and so we can have a world that we'd want to live in. When I talk about the future, I will say right off the bat, I have nothing particularly original to say about the topic. Um, this slide is a Time Magazine style list of aspects of globalization, of uh, new kinds of uh, scientific and technological innovations of political promise as well as political turmoil and turbulence. And if you're talking about the minds for the future, you have to put it against the backgrounds of the various facets of, of globalization. And since uh, Time Magazine as well as I use, use images, here are just some images to accompany that uh, laundry list of future events and future pressures. Uh, uh, discoveries in biology, megacities from around the world, the uh, commodification of everything and the internationalization of that commodification, circulation of money, um, trillion dollars a day, I guess that's half a trillion pounds circulate uh, um, every 24 hours in markets all over the world. One thing that I'm going to say several times tonight is almost everything that can be done by technology, whether it's computers or robots or virtual reality, will. And that, in a sense, makes almost all past education at least partially anachronistic because so much of what people had to do before are now going to be done by automata of various sorts. Virtual reality, uh, everything from architecture to surgery to airplane uh, navigation will increasingly take place in um, artificial intelligence environments. Lifelong learning and moving somewhat closer to my topic uh, about minds for the future. What this slide basically says is that people who are simply doing routine things in routine ways will have less and less of a place in the world of tomorrow. There's a need for thinking beyond specific disciplines, for thinking outside of the box, for being very flexible and being able to do things just in time. More and more work is being done by teams which assemble for the purposes of carrying out a mission and then move on to another site and carry on the mission there. And uh, I'm always a bit behind the times, but PowerPoint will, has probably already seen its, uh, its, its apogee. Um, so here are the five minds. And the structure of the rest of my talk will be to say something about each of these kinds of minds, what they're like, how they're nurtured, in each case, pathological forms of these minds. At the end, I'll talk a bit about the ambience in which I think the five minds are best nurtured, as well as some of the tensions between these minds, because they don't necessarily mesh. There are antagonisms among them. 
I was asked uh, at the uh, beginning of the millennium what I thought the greatest invention was of the last 2,000 years. And I thought for a while, and I said classical music. This is Mozart, who I worship above all other artists. And uh, I really do think classical music was a fantastic invention. But the truth is, the reason I gave the answer classical music was more because I wanted the pundit who asked me to quote what I said. And I knew that if I'd said the wheel or the pill, uh, many, many people would have said it. But yes, nobody said uh, uh, classical music, so I had my 15 seconds of, of coverage. Uh, uh, <laughs> but an answer which I would have given seriously, but alas, would not have been quoted, were the scholarly disciplines. Those of us who are in education in the academy and almost everybody who's here tonight probably is at least uh, related to those institutions, take the disciplines totally for granted. History, science, mathematics, the arts. Um, we assume that they're part of being human and that they've always existed. But in fact, a moment's thought uh, confirms that the disciplines were all invented in the last few thousands of e thousand years. Classical music is an invention of a few hundred years ago. History, probably, from the Greek Roman times. Science, as opposed to technology, is really an invention of, the, uh, of Europe in the 16th and 17th century. So the disciplines are very precious inventions. When barbarians take over, they usually try to wipe out all the disciplines except for warfare, which is a, you know, a discipline which has, has a very long history. When I talk about the discipline mind, I'm making two um, points, both based on the dual meaning of discipline in English. A disciplined mind is one that works steadily on things and gets better and eventually becomes an expert um, of one sort or another. And no matter how talented you are at birth, unless you work at something you're not going to attain expertise, you will not be a craft person, a professional, a scholar um, without the, the regular discipline. But the point that I focus on, because a lot of our research has shown that the second aspect of discipline is very difficult to achieve, are the distinctive ways of thinking which are associated with the major disciplines. It'd be nice to think that human beings evolved to think scientifically, but we didn't. Scientific, science thinking is a very unnatural way of thinking. Lewis Wolpert here in the UK has written much about this. Historic thinking is also um, quite unnatural. Of course, every society, every culture has stories and narratives, but that's very different from thinking historically. So just to say a word about those two disciplines to make them stand for the array of disciplines, scientific thinking involves creating a model of the world, an explanation of how the physical or biological or social world works. The model should yield some predictions. People carry out experiments or observations. Um, and if those um, empirical forays confirm the theory, the model, it lasts. If not, and as Karl Popper said, the real purpose is to show where it's wrong, then a new revised theory or model um, emerges. Very, very unnatural way of thinking. Very much against common sense. As a slide, says common sense says if A work, if A happens and then B happens, A caused B. And this goes back to Hume's philosophical writings. But of course, A may not cause B. Um, they might be caused by a third factor and be completely independent of one another. But you have to think scientifically not to confuse correlation with causation. Historical thinking is an attempt to reconstruct what happened in the past. It involves written texts, more recently graphic occasionally oral testimony. When you write history, you have to realize it only happened once. You can't do experiments. You have to realize it's human beings who have goals and who <coughs> try to achieve those goals in whatever way they can. And uh, history both involves recognizing what's uniform about human beings historically and prehistorically and cross-culturally, as well as what's very distinctive about human beings given the cultures that they live in. Perhaps most interestingly, and again, quite counterintuitively, is every generation has to, write, has to rewrite history. The most vivid example I can give is if you live in the United States today and you write the history of the Roman Empire, you would write it differently 
than if you'd been writing it 50 years ago, because now, for better or for worse, the United States is the Roman Empire. <laughs> and uh, you, it would be impossible not to think about those issues if you were a historian in the US today. So when I talk about the disciplined mind, I'm talking about those, those ways of thinking, those distinctive ways of thinking which humans have invented and are not completely natural. You might say, well, do you really need to know these? Um, you know, maybe you'd win the lottery and then you wouldn't. But I think you do, because if you want to make any kind of a decision as a citizen or any kind of a decision about health or about Medicare or, or medication or care of your children, if you can't think scientifically, historically, politically, you're just going to be helpless and you'll have to depend upon other people or just uh, um, toss a coin. Um, so I think that um, to be an engaged human being now, you need to have these disciplined ways of thinking, but you also need discipline in the first sense. You have to be good enough at something that um, people will value you and uh, that you'll be able to make a reasonable living as an expert in one sphere or another. Now, in each case, I'm going to talk about a, a form of this mind which doesn't quite work. Um, the no cigar is an allusion to a U.S. cliche, which I know if you go to a carnival and um, you, you're given a ball and you're supposed to toss it and knock down a Cupid doll, and if you get close, the barker says, close but no cigar. So these are uh, efforts to achieve these kinds of minds which are, are not entirely successful. Uh, one example is when you see everything just through your discipline. Um, the shoemaker who only looks at people's shoes, um, the lawyer who insists on being a lawyer with uh, her three-year-old child or with uh, the spouse when they're trying to decide to go to the movies. That, that's, a, that's an overemphasis of a discipline and realizing that every, not realizing that every discipline has limitations. Um, nowadays, as an academic, academic I feel that uh, this, um, you might say, hyperdisciplinarianism affects many people in evolutionary psychology who try to explain everything about human beings in terms of evolution or people from economics who try to explain everything via rational choice. These theories have their place, but they're not, uh, they're not all powerful. The other example is somewhat um, homier, but you already know that I am partial to music. Arthur Rubinstein was a great pianist of uh, 50 years ago, and uh, he was very, very talented. He was, a he was a prodigy, and he used to go all the around all the world giving um, concerts. And he got tremendous um, a claim, but he realized that he wasn't practicing. And anybody who knew a lot about music would realize that. That instead he was getting a claim because he knew what encores to play, he knew how to throw his hands up, he knew the dramatic things to do which would make it look like he had complete control of, um, of the instrument, but he realized that he had um, stopped honing his discipline. So as he describes in his autobiography, at the age of 30 or 35, he decided to um, stop going out at night, stop drinking, stop carousing, stop womanizing, and start working regularly every day, which he did for 50 or 60 more years and became, uh, even toward the end of his life, uh, a very, very good pianist, thereby really combining both senses of the word discipline. So mind number one, the discipline mind. The second mind is the, is the, is the synthesizing mind. And it's actually the one that I've become most fond of in working on, on, on this book because I think it's the mind that we all desperately need these days and yet um, there's really very little practical that we know of how to help people synthesize. This is a great synthesizer, Darwin, who in his 20s traveled the globe on the Beagle, took copious notes, and then for 20 years reflected on what he'd seen on his trip around the world, reflected on his own domestication of plants and animals, corresponded with every naturalist in the world, and then finally, 25 years later, uh, not far from here, his famous paper was given in 1858, and the next year he published On the Origin of Species, which is one of the great intellectual syntheses of, of all times. What does synthesis involve, and why do I think it's both important and rare? Nowadays, everyone in this room knows that we are inundated with information. Almost any topic that you put into a search engine, you will get so much information you couldn't possibly digest it, let alone remember it or use it. 
So what does the synthesizing mind have to do? First of all, it has to decide what to pay attention to and what to ignore. And there needs to be reasons for that. Um, can't be random or just to pick the first site on Google and assume that it's the best, because there are all kinds of adventitious reasons why something might be site number one. Then, when you've decided what to focus on, what's important, putting it together in a way that makes sense for you. Because if you can't hold on to it, retain it, put it into a framework, a theory, a grid, then it's going to be evanescent and you'll have to go back to the search engine or to the Wikipedia or to an old-fashioned thing called a library or get on the telephone and so on. But putting things together for yourself are not enough unless you're a hermit. Almost all of us, whether we're educators or journalists or work in business, um, need to be able to communicate syntheses to other people. And so after we've decided what's important, put it together for ourselves, we then have to be able to communicate it to other people. Murray Gelman, the Nobel Prize winning physicist, said in my presence 10 or 15 years ago, in the 21st century, the most important mind will be the synthesizing mind. And I think he was really onto something. When I say psychology has dropped the ball, um, I'm a psychologist. And before embarking on my own inquiry, I looked through textbooks to see what was available in synthesis, and I was able to find very little. So um, synthesis for dummies, because it was written by somebody who was just one step ahead of the student, is you first have to decide, of course, what you want to synthesize, but what, what will its form, what will its format be? Um, are you going to put together an essay? Are you going to give a talk? Are you going to prepare an annual report, something for a board, um, something for your classroom? Where do you start? Where's the dry land? Are there earlier syntheses? What do textbooks say? What does the most informed person you know say? You've got to start there. Then the key part, I think the part that separates the, the experts from the, the novices, is what's the method that you're going to use? What are the data you're going to look at? How are you going to evaluate them? What are the formats that you're going to use? I have a whole list of formats here from narratives to maps to equations to taxonomies. How are you going to organize and reorganize the material as you try to get closer to the end point, which is a synthesis which you're going to have to live, it, live with because time is finite. It's very, very important to have what I would call a proto-synthesis, a rough draft, done enough time beforehand so that you can get some feedback from knowledgeable people or from people who are going to have to be your audience and who are going to have to make sense of what it is that, that you've said. And then, of course, finally, because life is finite and because there are syntheses yet to come in the future, you have to be able to put it to bed and, and move on. And uh, those people who know how to do this and those people who know how to train other people to do this will be at a tremendous advantage in the years ahead. No cigar for Procrustean efforts, people who try to put too much in the synthesis so it's overwhelming. Not for syntheses which are too eccentric. I mean, they may be amusing, but they're not going to be very useful. As I say, the textbook that's too eccentric is better used as a doorstop. And in, in my book, Five Minds for the Future, I actually spend some time discussing two synthesizing works by contemporary writers and try to show my own aesthetic of what makes a good synthesis and what makes an inadequate synthesis. But I freely admit that I have my own standards, my own criteria. For me, people who try to lump th too many things together are not good synthesizers. Um, I much prefer people who can split and make distinctions and provide powerful um, examples of those distinctions. So for me, that's what makes a good synthesis. But if you're a teacher, the important thing is to help students um, recognize criteria and see when and when they're not applying those criteria. They can argue with them. And of course, ultimately, the good synthesizer has internalized the criteria, so he or she doesn't need to have a master providing feedback on that synthesis. The third kind of mind is one that will be familiar to everybody here, the creating mind. Um, Einstein is an icon of the creating mind in the 20th century. As is Virginia Woolf, two very different kinds of creators. And of course, there are creators in spheres across scholarship, across the arts, and in, and in the learned professions as well, 
though the creations there are less radical. I mean, we don't really want people in law or medicine to do things that are too radical, at least for us, whereas in the arts um, or in the sciences, nowadays we admire quite, uh, quite radical breakthroughs. We know from research and creativity that you can't simply start to create without having any disciplinary kind of mastery. And indeed, in any discipline which has a history to it, not a discipline that's been invented last year, um, it takes up to a decade to master that discipline. And again, you need to do a certain degree of synthesis in order to be a creator. You can't assume that nobody's ever tried to put things um, together uh, before. In our own work, we call this big C creativity, and it is something that we want to reach for, though most of us are more likely to end up with middle C creativity than creativity of the Einstein, Darwin, Virginia Woolf variety. By definition, work and people who are creative go beyond what's known. The phrase is they think outside the box. And that's more and more important because anything that's in the box will be in the computer. And if you can just do what the computer can do, um, you will be all too expendable. The creative mind comes up with new questions, new methods, new combinations, new, new disciplinary nexes, and so on. And until I began to study creativity, I assumed that creativity was best thought of as a cognitive endeavor, with people having a certain kind of mind. And certainly, it's useful to have a mind if you want to be creative. But my research and that of my colleagues brings to the fore two aspects of creativity which are less well known and appreciated. One is that probably the nature of your personality and temperament is very, very important if you want to be creative. Creative people are ones who are never satisfied. They like taking risks. When something doesn't work, they don't kick the dog or quit. They, that they get energized to try again something new. Jean Monnet, the, the, the great economist who was behind the, uh, the common market in the European Union, said, I regard every defeat as an opportunity. And that is the, the mental state, the, fra the frame of mind, the, uh, um, the, the stance of the creative individual. And if I wanted to nurture creativity, I'd spend a lot of time helping people deal with criticism so they aren't floored by it, but rather, but rather energized by it. The other aspect of creativity is we tend to confuse it with novelty. But it's easy to do things that are novel. I could give the rest of this talk with the water over my head. Uh, it might be amusing. It would be novel, but it certainly wouldn't be creative because it wouldn't affect what anybody else does. It would just be seen as being weird. The only way to know that something is creative is to have informed people, which we call the field, make judgments. So, Einstein began to be accepted when Max Planck and other great physicists said, this guy's onto something, even though he isn't in the university and he's working in a patent office and so on. And that's true for almost any outstanding creator. Um, it takes some time for people to separate out um, what's worthwhile and what's not. Uh, what I say about that is because the field sometimes takes a long time to make its judgment, you can never know for sure that you're creative because that might only be discovered after your death. But the good news is you'll never know for sure that you're not creative because maybe like Van Gogh and Emily Dickinson and Gregor Mendel, you'll be discovered uh, posthumously. Um, no cigar. A lot of books are bestsellers. A lot of art shows put on lots of art. But my guess is even if you looked at the list of Turner Prize winners or Booker Awards, you would find that most of them become obscure pretty quickly. And we know there are many famous artists and writers who never were in the Royal Society, never won the Nobel Prize. Um, so those things I would call interesting, but they tend to be, really be too far out to affect anybody, or just a very good example of what everybody else is doing. Um, in the area of um, physical sciences, um, in 18th century, um, people used to think that you had um, materials that were combustible because they joined with something called phlogiston. It was a special substance that made things burn. Um, in the 19th century, people thought that time and space um, existed in something called the ether um, until Einstein 
showed, based on both theoretical and empirical work, that there was no reason to um, hypothesize uh, an ether. And a recent example um, from the United States was the great um, excitement about cold fusion 10 or 15 years ago, where people said we can get infinite amounts of energy just from water and electrodes, and we don't have to do anything at all fancy. But cold fusion, like phlogiston and ether, um, turn out to be um, not creative because they are not uh, domain changing. Now, when I spoke about this the other day at um, the Open University, um, people rightly pointed out, well, um, if uh, people talked about phlogiston or ether in, in good faith, would that really be non-creative? And the answer I gave them was truthfully that I had only in my book focused on cold fusion. And with cold fusion, it's fair to talk about um, this as not being creative because while there were some promising experiments, when these were experiments were challenged, the, the scientists who carried them out became defensive, backed out, wouldn't provide their data, and it basically didn't follow the rules of scientific work. So in that sense, I think you would, you would not want to call it creative work. I would have to do more due diligence about phlogiston and ether before I could give you a, a good answer about the ways in which that was or was not creative. Until this point, I've spoken very much from the point of cognition or thinking, how um, the mind works in terms of what goes on in academic settings. And that's in part because my own work has been focused very much on the disciplined mind, the creating mind, and more recently, the synthesizing mind. But um, I'm going to argue tonight that at least important for those of us who are interested in policy is to go beyond cognition and to consider two other kinds of minds, which I call the respectful mind and the ethical mind. The respectful mind is rather easy to describe. It basically involves acknowledging that we have all kinds of human beings and all kinds of groups in the world. Many of them look differently and have different mores than we do. Perhaps when we evolved thousands of years ago, we could stick together and ignore those people or fight with them and one group would win and one group would lose. But now, of course, while we have more people than ever in the world, we're also closer in countless ways to people. And um, at the very minimum, one needs to have tolerance, that is, acceptance of people who are different from us. But ideally, one wants to have respect. And respect means an effort to try to empathize with others, try to understand them, try to make common cause with them, give them the benefit of the doubt. And respect, I contend, begins from birth. It has to do with how parents relate to children, how children relate to one another on the playground. Within school settings, it's how adults relate to one another, teachers to teachers, teachers to parents, adults to children, teachers to staff, and so on. Um, I visit a lot of schools, particularly in the United States, and I believe that I can tell very quickly when I go into a school whether there is a, a genuine respect in the institution, in the environment, or whether the respect is put on for my benefit or whether it's very top-down, very authoritarian, you know, do what I say or else. Some examples of no cigar, this is, a, the first one is a line that's become quite popular in the United States, but I assume it's transparent here as well, kiss up, kick down. Basically, if someone has power over you or you want something from them, you're nice to them, but otherwise you ignore them or mistreat them and so on. Bad jokes telling jokes at the expense of other groups, even when you think everybody will find them amusing, they're, they're a dangerous thing to embark on, though probably few of us have not made that error. Tolerance is obviously better than intolerance, but respect goes beyond tolerance. It's a genuine effort to try to um, join in with other people. And I don't believe that one has respect eternally. There are people who can um, sacrifice uh, worthiness of respect. But on the other hand, I think respect with too many conditions, I'll respect a person if he or she always behaves wonderfully toward me and never does anything wrong and you know, gives my kids presents and so on, I think that, that that's going too far. To um, put a, perhaps a more positive spin on this, um, I jotted down some of the 
entities in our world now which I think have tried to deal with what happens when you have an intolerant or disrespectful society. Um, we all know about the Commission on Peace and Reconciliation in South Africa, set up um, under Mandela and Tutu, where victims and victimizers spend time together in the same space and try to understand one another and try to forgive, though of course they can't forget. But actually, close to three dozen countries now have commissions like this, and in places like Northern Ireland or the former Yugoslavia, I think they're necessary if you want to move on. Um, I also have two examples from the area of music. Um, some years ago, Daniel Bernboim and Edward Said set up an orchestra in the Middle East called the Devon Orchestra, which actually had Israeli and Palestinian young people play together during the day and talk about political issues at night. And this has continued right through to the present, though obviously it's not a good time for um, Middle Eastern uh, civility, let alone respect. Um, in the United States, Yo-Yo Ma, the, the wonderful cellist, about 10 years ago set up something called the Silk Road Project, which involves musicians and musics from the 2,000 miles of the old Silk Road all the way from Asia through to Europe. And Yo-Yo, who actually studied anthropology when he was an undergraduate, um, is interested in having people realize that nothing invented in music was ever uh, simply invented in one place. The, uh, the syncretism and the transmission and the cultural contact is absolutely imminent in all of music. And he hopes that uh, the understandings will extend beyond, beyond the musical realm. And I think in a time where respect is so important and yet often such a rare commodity, paying a lot of attention to these political and aesthetic, um, also ping pong diplomacy comes to mind. It actually began the US-China connection 30 years ago. These are, these are important respect engendering institutions. Um, I thought I would do a little confessional here. Um, as a, a card-carrying member of something in the United States called the American Civil Liberties Union, uh, I initially um, made common cause with the, car the cartoonists in Denmark who were making uh, critiques of Islam and with the minister in France uh, some years ago who said that French students should not be allowed to wear scarves in school. But I actually changed my mind about this and it was thinking about the issues of respect. I decided, rightly or wrongly, that for me in this case respect trumped the opposite value, not because the opposite value is unimportant, but basically it seems to me the cost was too great. And of course, the cost has been deaths, um, as well as uh, great tension, which continues till this day, as my last points here remind us. Uh, the the um, opera production in Germany, which was canceled um, because the Idomeneo, the Mozart opera, was seen as being insulting to Islam. I think it's still a question whether it's going to be mounted or not. And of course, in Britain, people are very well aware about uh, Jack Straw's um, temperature rising remarks about uh, the wearing of veils here in Britain. So issues about respect and its relationship to ethics are, are very much around us every day. The ethical mind is more difficult to describe briefly. Respect, as I said, is something that young people can sense almost from birth. It goes back to the most elementary human relations. When I speak about ethics, I am talking about an abstract capacity to think of oneself not just as Howard Gardner, but as a worker and as a citizen. So if you conceptualize yourself as a worker, you say, I'm a teacher, I'm a journalist, I'm a physician. What are my responsibilities in enacting that particular role. If I want to live up to the core values of that profession, what is it that I should be doing? And I also believe an abstract attitude is required to think about yourself as a citizen, as a citizen of your community. If you live in London, the, the borough that you live in, the citizen of your region, whether it's Britain or Europe, and then the citizen of the world, the citizen of the planet with uh, implications for ecology, climate change, the survival of 
species and so on. And a person who thinks ethically is able to make that intellectual leap um, and to think about himself or herself in those kinds of roles. And of course, not just thinking that way, but acting appropriately with regard to those roles. Um, this is a, a bit of a leap. It, 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 it came out of my mouth last night, so I'm going to share it with you. Uh, my daughter, who's here with me uh, today, and I went to see the movie The Queen the other day. Um, we thought this was an appropriate country to see the movie. Uh, the thought I had is that the queen occupies a role. It's a role which nobody else in the world occupies, and probably most of us have a great deal of difficulty understanding that role. The tension in the movie was how should that role be enacted in Britain in 1997. We don't have to make that decision because I don't think anybody here is going to be queen, but we do have to make those decisions about ourselves in our jobs and in our citizenship. I've been working in this issue for the last 12 years on a project called the Good Work Project, carried out with uh, Bill Damon and Mike Csikszentmihalyi. We've been studying good work in the United States. And we describe good work, for these purposes, ethical work, work that is high in quality, the discipline is top flight, but also work that is ethical, that is socially responsible, work where the worker says, not what do I want, what's good for me, but what ought I to do as a scientist or an artist or a, um, particularly a professional. Most of our work has been in the professions, law, medicine, science, and so on. And the third aspect of good work the third E, excellence in ethics, is engaging. Um, good work has to be meaningful to people or they can't carry it out. It's too difficult. And the people who are most admired in the world by not just me, but by many people, are people who are able to work in terms of those three E's, excellence, ethics, and engagement. And we've studied over 1,200 people in nine different professions, as well as a number of institutions in an effort to understand in what does good work consist today, and how do people carry out good work or fail to carry out good work at times when things are changing very quickly. Our whole sense of time and space is being altered by technology. And most important for, for our argument, markets are very powerful, and we don't have forces which used to exist to temper markets, religious, communal, um, ideological kinds of forces. So good work is a study of how do people manage to be ethical, um, excellent, and engaged, or fail to do so in our, in our current environment. The summit of good work are people who are universally admired, people like uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Of course, uh, Gandhi is, again, hugely admired. Um, and. Uh, person less readily recognized, but very important, the, uh, the, the Burmese dis dissident, An Su Si Ki, who for many, many years has been under house arrest as she tries to lobby for a government that's worthy of her, worthy of her, of her country. Um, and you'll notice that two of these three people, who are giants in the same way that Einstein and Darwin and Wilfred giants, were assassinated. And uh, you know, uh, An Su's life is also often in jeopardy for these reasons. So good work is, is not easy, and that's one reason if it's not highly meaningful to you as it was for these people, um, it's unlikely to be carried out. Now, it would be nice to be able to say that everybody wants to be a good worker and everybody tries, but in another study um, carried out with several colleagues, we studied over 100 young people in America in three different professions. These were people in school or in internships or in their first jobs. And we discovered a very unsettling picture, which I want to share with you. These young people all know what good work is. And they would like to be good workers. And they admire people who are excellent and ethical and engaged. And of course, some of them themselves live up to these high standards. What we discovered in the United States was that many of these people told us, someday we want to be good workers. But we don't think we can afford to be good workers now. We don't think we can afford to be ethical. 
because we don't think our peers are. We don't trust them. We think they're cutting corners. We think they're doing everything to advance. And we don't want them to get the positions of power and prominence at our expense. And so what they say is someday we'll be good workers, and then we'll try to teach and train other people to be good workers. But right now, give us a pass. I'm, I'm reminded of what St. Augustine said. Uh, uh, he said, oh, Lord, make me chaste, but not quite yet. And this is, this is what the good workers are, are saying. And the phrase moral freedom comes from Alan Wolf, uh, a very excellent sociologist in the United States. He says that um, no society can exist without a moral core. And this comes out of sociology, people like Max Weber and Emil Durkheim. But Wolf goes on, the Americans, and just the Americans he's talking about now, people from the United States, are the first society in the history of the world where people think that they can decide for themselves what's moral and what's not. And uh, Wolf wrote about this before we did our study. And what we saw was over and over again, young people saying, as long as I have good intentions and someday I'm going to do the right thing, don't bother me with making me too accountable nowadays. No cigar for compromised work. Compromised work is what too many of us, and I'm sure I'm guilty of it, sometimes do. We don't do something in our work that's illegal. That's bad work. That's, that's Enron or um, giving your students the answers to the examination. But many of us do compromised work. We don't do the extra due diligence when we're writing a story in journalism. Um, we don't do the necessary control when we're doing a scientific experiment. Uh, we know in the area of accounting, too many people work both for the auditing agency and for the, the company as a consultant. And that's not, that's not acceptable. So I've been particularly studying compromise work, work that is isn't uh, strictly illegal, but of course, both of these are perils, uh, um, bad work and, and compromised work. Summary. I've described five kinds of minds, three of them cognitive, disciplined, synthesizing, and creating, and two of them in the human sphere, the more direct respect, which we owe to our neighbors and to our families and to people who are more remote, and the more abstract kind of ethics, ourself in roles such as a professional or a, or a citizen. Ideally, as a policymaker, I would hope that we could engender all five of these minds in young people. And by far, the best way to do it is a way that all of our grandparents knew, namely to put them in environments where these kinds of minds are modeled, where people do have discipline can synthesize, are willing to break new ground, treat one another with respect, and take the ethical stance. So the desire for these minds uh, is easy to justify. And the belief that if they are in the air, in the atmosphere, they're more likely to be achieved is, again, uncontroversial. Um, this goes beyond the banal when it comes to choosing the place that you work. Sometimes people have no choice, but often they do. And one of the important things is to be able to take the temperature of the institution which you decide to work at and to say, is good work modeled there? Similarly, some people have no choice about mentors or about uh, role models. But to the extent that you do, and we can all choose what's called a paragon, somebody from history or even from mythology to identify with, do you pick people who wanted to have it all before they died were people who um, behaved in, in ways that were, that were responsible and ethical. However, as I said at the beginning, there are tensions between these kinds of minds. I described one with reference to myself, namely the question, why do I go by the, we might say, the, the US Constitution and the ethics implied there, or do I go by more person-to-person -person respect? And that's a place where I actually changed my mind. I did the opposite in recent years at my own university, where I decided at some cost to become a public critic of the president of the university, because as someone who'd been there for many years, I concluded that um, I had an obligation as a citizen of that community to speak up. And that's a case where ethics trump respect. 
the more familiar kinds of tensions are between discipline and creating. If you are too much in your area of a discipline, you're not, you don't have a distance from it, and you're unlikely to break out of it and try something new. An even greater amount of tension exists between respect and creativity. Because we owe our teachers and our mentors a certain degree of respect, but being creative almost always reject, involves in rejecting the mentor's model at a certain point. But can we do that, and what's the cost? It's frequently noted that in East Asia, students, protégés, have an enormous respect for their mentor. For that very reason, many of them end up leaving the country and coming to the West, because it's easier there to forge your own path than it is to do when the huge shadow of your mentor um, uh, is in front of you. So even though the five kinds of minds would be great to have as an ensemble, there are going to be tensions. And even though I think everybody can develop some aspects of these kinds of minds, probably will end up in the cognitive sphere having some people who are more synthesizers and some people who are more creative and so on. Interestingly, in the end, nobody can put these minds together for you. You have to put them together yourself. And I think of that as sort of the ultimate synthesis. It's a personal synthesis. If you believe the pentad that I put forth, how do you put them together in a way that makes sense for you? So finally, closing thought from the wise New Englander. This is Ralph Waldo Emerson, famous 19th century philosopher from New England. And um, Emerson declared that character is more important than intellect. I have spent my life studying intelligence and creativity largely from an amoral perspective, because you can't understand those properties unless you study people whom you don't like, who exemplify them, as well as people whom you like. But uh, certainly, I concluded, and the events of the last 10 or 15 years have contributed mightily to that, that we don't have a lack of people who are smart in various ways. We have a lack of people who act in ethical ways, people who display and uh, embody uh, character. And so I uh, applaud uh, Emerson's insight of, uh, of many years ago. If you want to pursue any more of these ideas, yeah. If you want to know what I'm up to, you can look at howarddardner.com. And I'm happy to show you that my new book actually has a cover, uh, <laughs> Five Minds for the Future. And uh, before too many months have elapsed, I hope that some of you will uh, uh, take a look at it. Thank you. So how do these five minds feature in our current education system? Let's hear our teachers' responses to the lecture and how it resonates with their work. I, I do feel that we do have to look at the future at respect and ethics and what do we want? The ch world is changing so much mm. that what do we want to equip people with? With my subjects, um, mathematics, then very much it's to do with confidence. It used to be that it was maths was either right or wrong and that's what um, Howard Garden was talking about. Um, but now what we try to encourage is very much that they're talking about maths and talking about um, when their ideas are true or sometimes true or always true so that you can have that discussion going in the classroom. I think that what came over to me was the fact that we are changing so rapidly that a lot, maybe a lot of the curriculum content that we're doing is perhaps not helping our students to actually learn. And what, what I took away from it was maybe we need to have a more um, uh, connected curriculum. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe we're too isolated in, within our mean. subjects. Yes, I mm. agree with that. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that came across to me was a lot of what he was talking about is what we teach in English anyway. We look at creativity. We Obviously, they have to be disciplined. We look at synthesising information in order to write essays on texts mm -hmm. and things. And we also are involved very much in respect and ethics because we teach literature. And the best literature is based on ethics and respect and morality. I think the thing is with the, the respectful mind, 
I'm a little bit concerned about that with the fact that being a form tutor, which most of us are, mm -hmm. yes. if we, we, we have a form and the pastoral side, yes. and how do you, when he talked about the child, you know, from birth, respect, knowing respect from birth, if you have a child that hasn't had that, that, you know, has had perhaps not being brought up within their own family, perhaps being brought up elsewhere, mm. and how do we as educators how do we get around that? How do we use this and help them? Be, because let's face it, that children sometimes can be angry. Mm. Well, people talk about a, lot, a loss of respect and they say that there was a lot more respect years ago, but I disagree with that. I think that um, we're in a much better position now to show mutual respect and to show by example, whereas mm. before, um, pupils were frightened of the teachers, so it wasn't a real respect. Mm. Yeah, it, it was a, a fear. Yes, but I say to my classes, my one rule is that we respect each other. I re will respect you, and you must respect each other, mm. yourself and me. Yes, so I think if they have respect for you and you have respect for them, then all the other things yeah. follow, mm. don't they? I think there's an awful lot that actually goes across all subjects anyway. If we take the, the, those five minds, the, the synthesising, the discipline, and that was interesting because um, the, 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 the analogy you gave about it, it, to be good at something, you know, the 10-year rule yeah. and the mm. lifelong learning. Yeah. And, I, I, you know, as a, personally, I'm committed to lifelong learning. But do we get that enough of that over to our students? Are we actually um, embarking with, with our students? We sort of talk about educating and we talk about learning and learning to learn. But do, do we see it in a wider context rather than just in the school context? I think it's really important that we do see it in the wider context and we promote um, cross-curricular views within the students. It's important yeah. that um, if the school can give us, if our schools can give us time to talk to each other <laughs> and to develop a more integrated curriculum. I think there's a lot that I will take away from this lecture um, to be able to talk to my form yeah. about because um, they have lots of firm views and of their own and it's interesting to hear about what they think mm. about respect and what they think about different scenarios. I saw lots of links with this into citizenship and yes. PSHE. Yes. Well we teach PSE as form tutors, yeah. we teach our forms PSE, I teach year seven study skills and I feel very much that those are the things that that's where I'm taking this back to. Yeah, I, I feel that too. I think this, the, the five minds and talking about it, you know, the discipline mind, the synthesising, the creative mind, and then ethics and respect. Mm. I think that's something that we can discuss within citizenship mm. and mm. within uh, PSHE because yeah. it, you know, it is some, it, it is the future.